it's my pleasure to <laughs> announce the first lecture of the morning by Nicolao Rantan. It's called the Quantization of Spectral Curves to Topological Recursion. <laughs> thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for giving the opportunity to give this uh, lecture. Uh, I hope it, wi it will be helpful for at least some of you here. It will follow a bit the lectures of Bertrand from last week. So for those who have seen it, um, I will, or those who have not seen it, I will recall just a few things. So the topic of this lecture will be a quantization of spectral curves <laughs> by topological recursion. Uh, so can you read it? Yeah, on the camera as well. Okay. So let me begin with a short introduction using the Airy curve, which was studied quite a lot as far as I could hear last week. So last week you've seen different lectures. In two of them, you've seen application of the topological recursion for solving problem of enumeration. And in, the, the, uh, in Bertrand's lecture, you've seen another property of the topological recursion which is that it can be used in order to quantize spectral curves. What do I mean by that? What Bertrand showed you is that if you start from the simple curve, y square is equal to x, so you define an, uh, a curve in C2 by this uh, equation, then the topological recursion produces for you some function which we will call psi a function of x and h bar, a formal parameter, such that it is solution to a differential equation of this form, h bar square d2 over dx square psi of x h bar is equal to x times psi of x h bar. So, this tells you that not only topological recursion starting from this curve allows you to recover uh, intersection numbers, so problem related to, uh, to algebraic geometry, but the generating, you can build a generating series for these numbers, which are solution to a differential equation of this form. And this differential equation, I am, I'm saying that it's a quantization of the spectral curve I started from, because one way to write it is to say that you could trade your original curve y square minus x equals to zero to y hat square minus x hat acting on psi x h bar is equal to zero, where y hat and x hat are, different, are operators acting on psi with y hat being just h bar d over dx, and x at being just the multiplication by x. From this point of view, this differential equation can be seen just as a quantization of the original spectral curve, where you replace your function y and x by uh, operator acting on psi. And these two operators, y hat and x hat, they do not commute. Uh, which is uh, in contrary to what you had before, the so commutator gives you h bar. And that's the reason why we talk about quantization of this spectral curve. Is it clear for everybody? Yeah. Okay. So before I go further, I just want to mention something else related to this curve, which is that this differential equation here, you can linearize it pretty easily. In this case, you can obtain it by looking at a linear system of size two. Of this form, psi one of x, psi two of x. Yeah, and this depends on h bar everywhere, sorry. Uh, 
where L of x is a two by two matrix, which has a very simple form, zero, one, x, zero. So if you look at this uh, differential equation, the first line just tells you that psi two of x h bar is equal to h bar d over d x of psi one of x h bar. And the second line of this equation tells you that h bar d over d x psi two is equal to x times psi one. So it means that psi one is solution to this equation. So that's why I'm saying that here I've got a, 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 rep a linear representation of my uh, of my differential equation. And just to make the link with the name spectral curve. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So for me, normally quantization, I start from from some Poisson structure, yeah. okay? So in this case, uh, I would have to say that um, what you're really doing, you have this spectral curve, you probably have fixed some divisor and then you built uh, some Poisson structure or the, uh, you know, in the book coordinates so that Y and X satisfy the standard Poisson. Poisson structure where? On which space? Because when I'm thinking about uh, such problem, the Poisson structure I have in mind is the Poisson structure on the space of... Uh, but that's the quantum quant one. Sorry? That's the quantum one, yeah. right? So, so that's what I'm saying, that essentially you're thinking about y and x as the book coordinates, right? That's what, yeah, when you want to quantize, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, but, um, yeah, just let me mention that at the end of the day, what we're using a lot is not this, uh, this Poisson structure, what we're using a lot is the Poisson structure on the space of SL2 matrices in this case. Okay, so in this case, we have a very simple case uh, which was presented by Bertrand, where the spectral curve has genus zero, and basically the genus corresponds to the dimension of the symplectic space you use in order to quantize, and so in this case it has dimension zero, so it's a very simple case. Um, uh, Olivier will present what happened in a more general case and he will present uh, Darbu coordinate on this space. But indeed, what you would like to have eventually, and that's not what we're doing, is to have a Poisson structure in the space of X and Y in order to quantize. But that's not what we're doing. Okay. okay. So we've got this uh, representation here and just to mention the fact that now where does this Y square is equal to X come from? You just look at the characteristic polynomial of L of X. So this, the spectral curve is basically the locus of, um, of eigenvalue of your matrix in L of X. Now this case is very simple. It is coming from the fact that we've got a genus zero curve to start with. And this is the reason why this matrix L of X is very simple and is basically independent of h bar. You will see later in the lecture what happens when the curve has higher genus, and that's one of the big um, complications that can occur. Okay, so now this was this nice um, airy curve case which has been studied from a many, many different points of view. And now um, there is the conjecture which is there, I think, since the topological recursion was built, uh, I guess motivated more by the matrix model perspective, Bertrand, I think you had it from the beginning, which is that this quantization procedure, you could do it actually for any algebraic curve. Meaning that if you start from um, an algebraic curve E of xy is equal to zero. Maybe not uh, the curve, but maybe not even a, um, 
an hyperelliptic curve, it is believed that the topology color recursion allows you to build some wa wave function psi depending on x and h bar. As in this case, such that it is solution to a differential equation of the same type obtained by quantizing x and y, where now if you start from, let's say, a polynomial E, you get a family of polynomial which now might depend on h bar, and you want it to be such that E of zero x, y is equal to your original spectral field. So there was this conjecture basically stating that using topological recursion, there is a way to build a wave function, which is solution to a differential equation obtained by quantizing the original spectral field. So here there are many things which are not precise at all in the sense that I don't tell you how I build psi. So for example, here you had one way to build psi in this case, which was a genus zero case. In the IO genus case, it's gonna be much more complicated. I don't tell you what kind of property I want for E. In what I will present, you will see that one of the property I will have is that I, I don't change basically the, the pole structure of my original spectral curve. So from a, an integrable system perspective, it means that I'm staying in the same integrable system. And I want that the h-bar goes to zero limit recovers the, the original curve. So going to a classical limit from this quantized case, you go back to the curve you started from. Okay, so this was, was a conjecture which was there for a long time. And it has been proved in many cases, case by case, and then the first the first kind of general proof which appeared was uh, a proof by Bouchard and Enar when the spectral curve defined by d of x y equals zero uh, as so it was the first general proof which was already something quite big in the sense that if you start from any algebraic curve of this type where the genus is zero, then you can quantize, in, uh, quantize it using the topological recursion. There are many ways to quantize it, uh, many ways to define psi, for example, and they studied a different way and how, uh, what different, um, differential equation you will get. So you get different orderings because you see you start from a polynomial in two variable where the two variable commutes. So when I quantize it, I've got two non-commuting variables. So there might be some ordering issues, different choice of ordering. And in these papers, they study how you can change the ordering by changing the definition of your wave function. Now, going away from genus zero is quite a big issue. Um, I mean, it was known for, from the beginning, I think, uh, from, the, um, from the matrix model perspective that uh, the, the wave function which is working for the genus zero case is not enough for working in the IO genus case. The wave function used for quantizing the genus zero case is such that the logarithm of psi is basically a series in H bar. If you try to do something like that when your spectral curve has higher genus, this is not working. What you need are uh, function of h bar for psi, which are much more complicated, which are some kind of trans series. And this makes that uh, all the, the proof for getting a quantization is much more complicated. And the first proof of this conjecture for a genus one case was uh, provided by Iwaki who proved it for uh, elliptic curves. Meaning curve of this form, y square is equal to x u plus a x plus b. 
So this is, a, let's say, a particular case because it's just one family of spectral curves. But it's really important in the sense that it is the first time where a genus one curve was quantized using in the topological recursion. This opened the way for considering any hyperelliptic curve. And this was done uh, by independently by Bertrand and Elba. And, um, and Olivier and myself for hyperelliptic curve. So curve of the form y square is equal to q of x, where q is a rational function. It oh, yeah. Would you just repeat what Iwaki did from the Iwaki family? did quantize this curve, uh, this family of curves. So it's a very specific type of hyperelliptic curve. It's y x square is equal to x cubed plus ax plus b. Now what we did is instead of having just a cubic polynomial, we can consider any rational function of x. And Iwaki can do it for any genus, yes? So this curve has genus one. Ah, uh -huh, I see. Okay. So this is a torus. Now if you consider, so for example, if you, if you would consider here a polynomial of degree five or six for Q, you will get a genus two curve. If it could be a polynomial of degree four, you get a genus one curve and so on. So in our case, we can consider arbitrary genus. And so from the integrable system perspective, this corresponds to, to studying systems of higher and higher dimension. And finally, we join together in order to prove the conjecture for any algebraic curve. Uh, up. So the four of us last year, uh, we proved it for any, there are some generated CT condition, but basically it's for any algebraic curve. So the proofs of this conjecture, actually, if you look at it, it's not that, um, it doesn't use very complicated tools, but it's a lot, quite a lot of computations. So I will definitely not show you this. What we will show you today with Olivier is this part. We'll consider a rather generic uh, hyperelliptic curve and we will show you one way of quantizing it using the topological recursion. Yeah. Uh, just do you hope to, to find the same kind of result for not algebraic curves like for linear? So linear. yeah. Um, so here I'm just talking about algebraic curve and particular uh, curve uh, in C, C square. So maybe what you have in mind the uh, curve in C star square. So when, when you just have curve, it's not, uh, it's not even a curve. What do you mean not even a curve? Like when you just have some germs of, uh, of functions and this kind of stuff and there is no. Ah, no, 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 okay. this I don't expect. So okay. if you think of germ of function above the branch points, you mean? Yes. Okay. So you see that when I'm talking about that, I'm kind of using a yeah, yeah. Function, X, uh, function X here, which is a coordinate in a base curve. So mm -hmm. what I'm looking at is a spectral curve, which, of, which is a cover of P1. Mm -hmm. So here it will be a double cover with a bunch of ramification points. Um, and basically X is this covering map. If I don't have a kind of global picture, I, I don't even know how to yeah, sure, sure. define this. I just want to, yeah. But I, it's a good question, so something I will uh, not present here and which has not been proved is what happened, for example, if instead of having a cover of P1, we would have a cover of a uh -huh. torus. So the, this generalization 
uh, would correspond to, to having, uh, for example, some uh, X bundle. Uh, we believe that it should be working, so uh, Dumitrescu and Mulase did some work already in this direction, which basically is working in the genus, uh, it's not the genus which is important here, it will, where the, the dimension of the prime variety of your cover is vanishing, but we believe that it would be working. Also, you could have some, add some symmetries and things like that. We believe that should be possible to quantize curve in C star square to where you work with exponentially variable. In which case you see, so quantizing the X is okay. It's just multiplication by X or when you take the, the exponential is nothing important. But when you quantize Y, you would have exponential of h bar d over dx. And so, yeah, maybe I can ask a question. Does anybody know what this kind of operator is doing? Yeah, OK. So this is a shift operator. So what you would get would not be a differential equation anymore, but it would be a finite difference equation. OK? Uh, so the belief is that, yeah, everything should flow. And actually, the structure of the proof for this general case is such that we have some good hope that just with a few complications because uh, of technicalities, uh, it should go through in the same way. Okay, yeah, another question. Sorry, this one's just shorter. So the last bullet point basically is the conjecture is closed. Uh, so the yeah, I mean, yeah, but uh, yeah. Okay. We have a setup, so we've got some condition for this kind of curve such that we built a family of function solution to a differential equation of Like this there's type. a notion of E has to be nice enough for. Yeah. Okay. But, but so some, uh, some of the, the constraints we did put was just for uh, not having a paper which was too technical. So some of them can be read. Some other are a bit more complicated, but it, it's already very, very large. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So. That's it for the introduction, so now let's start the, the proof. So, yeah, uh, so there will be an exercise session uh, tomorrow morning. So since the, the, the proof is a bit technical in the sense that there are a lot of computation involved in the, in the proof, but they are not that complicated, but it takes quite a lot of time. Some step of the proof will not be done today, but you will have to do it in the exercise session tomorrow. Okay? So, let's start by just saying uh, from what kind of spectral curve we start, uh, we, we start from for, for the topological equation today. So, I will just introduce the space of spectral curves. which I will consider today. So what I want today is that we start from hyperelliptic curves. Uh, which are not ramified above poles. So what do I mean by that? Uh, Bertrand, can I erase that? Yeah. So I will start from equation of this type. Y square is equal to Q of X, where Q of X is a rational function. I will be a bit restricted for Q of X, and this is just in order to avoid um, complicated notation for the lecture. Uh, in such a way that Q of X takes this form. It will, it will have a pole when X goes to infinity, so there is a polynomial part, 
sum from k equals zero to two times what I call r infinity minus two h infinity k x to the power k. So r infinity is related to the degree of the pole at infinity. And I will say that it might have poles at some other point, which I call lambda nu, or nu going from one to n, of respective degree one to two times r nu, h in uh, h nu k divided by x minus lambda k uh, minus lambda nu to the power k. So here what I say is that I'm assuming that I've got even degrees for the, sorry? Okay. A lot bigger? Yeah. So k goes from zero to two times r infinity minus two. I call h infinity k, infinity k the coefficient of x to the power k. Plus, and I allow poles at finite point. Uh, nu is equal to one, from one to n of degree up to two times r nu, and I call h nu k the coefficient of x minus lambda nu to the power k. Is it better? Okay. So what do I mean by, so hyperleptic curve says that I've got an equation of this type, basically. Uh, can I ask you something? Yeah. Uh, just because I see that you are stopping that polynomial at an even order, are you thinking of Q of X as a determinant of some matrix which depends, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but here it's just, it just for, the, for the purpose of the lecture that I'm stopping at an even order uh, because otherwise, so basically the idea is that I will have to introduce local coordinates uh, above in X equals to infinity and I don't want to have to deal with square roots. Uh, I think that Olivier might mention what happened in the, the case where it is odd. But so the fact that I've got even here and there, so I'm talking at some even order, means that my curve, because I've got y square is equal to q of x, if you look at the x plane, I've got infinity somewhere, and on that one up to lambda n. Here I'm writing by it. Not talking about that. And above infinity, I've got two points, which I will call infinity plus and infinity minus. Uh, is it large enough? Yeah. So if I would have stopped at some odd order, it would mean that I would be ramified above infinity and so in these two points would be together, they, they would be a, a branch point. And about lambda i, so about lambda 1, I will call the two points above mm -hmm. uh, alpha 1 minus and alpha 1 plus. Alpha and minus alpha n. So the fact that I'm stopping here to, to even degree tells you that you've got two points in the fiber above each of these poles. Yeah? Ah. Sorry? No, no, they don't have to be real. No, no. These are just arbitrary points in the, in the complex plane. So what I will do, whatever happens, I will put a pole at infinity, and in some cases I will consider it as a, as a unique pole when I'm setting n equals to zero. But if I want to have more than one pole, I will switch on the n. Uh, yeah? In the second term, when you have a pole, the top of the second term, I want to understand what it 
I will put the plus here. <laughs> yeah, sorry, the, the, the whiteboard is a bit small. Uh, so, so why do I put a two here? You will see it in a minute. Um, the R nu and R infinity are related to the degree of the pole of y dx at these different points. And here it's a zero. Okay, any more questions? Okay, I have two questions there. Uh, so Olivier? Do you think it was uh, wait. No, no. Uh, okay, so if you think about that curve from matrix model point of view, yeah. I think the potential is some polynomial plus log potential. Is that correct to think in that way? Plus log. Some yeah, log term. Yeah, yeah, you could have log terms, yeah. Okay, um, so then that's the space you want to think of. Sorry? Is that the space you want to think? So the, can I think that basically you want to think of the space of those potential and what kind of freedom you have? You, you could think of it from this point of view if it's better for you. Okay, so Here I, I think of it arbitrarily just from a um, space of spectral curve point of view. Yeah, yeah I, I'm fine with that. But then in that, at least, okay, if I think of that from matrix model point of view, then I have to think about, for example, uh, the feeding fractions. Yeah. And do you think about that fact as well? So I will talk about it. Okay. Just yeah, after. Sorry, yeah, thanks. So here you see, I'm not to about, I'm talking about the one form y dx. I'm talking about the function y square. So it's not exactly the same information that you get from the potential in the matrix model. I mean, not directly, okay? But you will see it in a second. It was just a question about the minus plus. Uh, it's just arbitrary over yeah. each point. Yeah, it's no an arbitrary labeling. So everything will be independent of this labeling in some sense. Um, Let's say I start from the beginning by saying, okay, this is the plus sheet of my cover and this is the minus one. Okay? Okay, so here I fixed um, my hyperelliptic curve. So I could think of the space of Q of X or the space of H here as being uh, a space of, um, of hyperelliptic curve. Uh, yeah, just to mention here, the one way to think about that is to think of Q of X times DX square as a quadratic differential defined on the base curve. And so you could put some uh, Poisson structures there and the notation H come from there. I mean, these are Hamiltonian related to the, the corresponding system. Okay, and so this is indeed the Poisson structure which is interesting for us. Now this is from the, this is from the perspective of Q of X, but so if Q of X takes this form, what happens for the one form Y dx? What I did here is kind of fixing the singular part of Y dx. It means that Y dx as poles at, so we've got two different kind of poles. It has poles at infinity plus, infinity minus, and the alpha i plus and alpha i minus. And um, the shape of the expansion around these poles is fixed by the shape of Q of x. Uh, so around, alpha nu plus or minus, one has the following behavior for y dx. So you can read it from there. Take the form sum k going from one to r nu, uh, x minus lambda nu to the power k, dx, and here the coefficient, I will call it t nu k, and alpha plus and alpha minus, they correspond to the value of y dx in the uh, two different sheets of the cover. 
And so y in one is related to the value of y in the other one just by a change of sign because we've got an equation of the type y squared is equal to q of x. When you fix the value of x, you fix the right hand side, and so there are two values for y which fits, one um, differing just by a sign. So the expansion are on plus and in alpha plus and alpha minus, they just differ by a sign. And then you have something which is holomorphic around this point, okay? This is more related to the potential of the, um, of the matrix model. No, oh, sorry, around infinity plus and minus, we have a similar exp expansion. We have a sum from k going from zero to, yeah. Read what is in the Sorry? order of, order oh, of, of the x. Okay. Yeah, so I'm considering a one form y dx, not the function y. K going from one to r infinity, t infinity k, x to the power k minus two, dx, and I've got something which is of order o x minus two dx. And here I choose just for the notation a minus plus sign because when we take, I want to extract these t's, this coefficient by taking residue and when I'm taking a residue at infinity, I get a minus sign. So it's just for, for uh, simplifying the notation later. So you see that there is a shift by minus two here. Uh, some people might wonder why it is there. I've got the one from y dx. Dx, um, dx has a pole at infinity actually. So in order to have something which is really good, you should consider d of a local variable, which would be x minus one here. So it gives you dx over x squared. And that's why I've got this O here, which is very good. Okay? Now going back to your question. Um, let's say I give you says expansion. So I give you the t's here and the t's there. Is it enough in order to fix y dx? The answer is no. Because, uh, I mean, in general, it is no. If I would have a genus zero curve, so if y dx was living on the sphere, I would have, for y of x, let's say, I would have a rational function. I know its poles. I know its expansion around its poles. So I could do um, uh, a decomposition of this function as a rational function. And this is enough in order to be happy. But here, I've got an higher genus curve, meaning that if I fix the pole structure, I can always add some holomorphic form to it. I will not change this formula, but I will change the one form. So in order to fix y dx completely, I will have to fix also its holomorphic part. So there are different ways to do it. What we will do uh, here, is by fixing the periods of y dx along some basis of cycle. So for this, uh, for, for in order to do that, we just consider we pick an arbitrary basis, a i d i, i ranging from one to G, of H1 of sigma. So sigma, I think I didn't say it before. What I call sigma is the algebraic curve defined by the equation y squared is equal to Q of X. Z. So here, G is the genus of my curve. So if I would have a genus zero curve, this would be dimension zero, so I don't have any basic, uh, any, any cycle I could choose here. And this corresponds to the fact that the space of holomorphic differential is, um, is a point, so I cannot shift anything here. 
No, here I can shift by holomorphic forms. So in order to do that, to know how I define it, I fix the basis of H1 such that AI intersection with VJ is delta IJ. And we call filling fractions periods along the A cycles. So for I in the set 1G, I take the periods along AI of YGX and I call it epsilon I. Okay? Now, if I give you the keys, so the coefficient of the expansion around each pulse of YGX, and the periods, no, it fixes YDX uniquely. Yeah. Don't you have to take the relative homology with respect to the poles because you might have residues at this point taking integrals? So with when relative to the poles? No, I don't have to do that. Why? YDX might have. Oh. Sorry? YDX might have poles, right? Yeah. YDX has poles at infinity plus minus and alpha plus minus. So depending whether you cycle surrounds poles or not? Yeah, it's a different basis. Uh, if you move it, you get a different basis, that's all. Okay. But uh, yeah, this is the same curve of tomotopy if you move a pole from inside and outside. I, it, it just gives you a different set of coordinates if you move it. Yeah, Bertrand maybe wants to. In fact, I think this is H1 of sigma or sigma minus pole Z, no? Yes. Uh, um, yeah, okay. I thought you were talking about relative to the poles, meaning, okay. Uh, so let's call P, where P is equal to the set Okay. Yeah, because they are in yeah. Okay. Now, um, just a remark. So first I presented the space of curve being given by the H over there, the coefficient of Q. Here I'm saying, okay, now what I could consider is the space of Y dx given by these T's and epsilon. How are the two related? Uh, I mean, if I fix Y dx, it means that I'm fixing Y, and so I'm fixing Y square. Now, what you can see is that if you look at the expansion of y square around one of its poles, you will get something of this form. So let's say you take the expansion of y square around infinity in terms of the t's, you get an, a polynomial part. What you will find out is that the first coefficient will just depend on the t's and not the epsilon. I mean, so you can write it explicitly in terms of the t's. But some of the H here, the for K being lower, they will depend on the part which is hidden there. Yeah? I, can you speak a bit louder? So, can you be more precise about your choice of value of H1 of, s of the punctured sigma? I just choose one, arbitrary. A's and B's, right? A's yeah. These are, uh, they generate A from the unpunctured sigma, right? Yeah, no, um, yeah, okay. Uh, but then also no, the I A's think and the A's. I think we don't have to remove the poles. The A's in the, Yeah, no, no, I don't see. Six. You did not write that equation I mean, and the B's also. Y you can do, yeah, y otherwise you would have something. Yeah, no, you don't need it. If you would have. So, so, so let me draw it. I've got my curve here. I've got a bunch of poles here. What I need is just to. Uh, okay. A basis yeah. of this type. Right. Which means that also the A's don't intersect and the B's don't intersect among themselves. Sorry? So. 
Yeah. What I'm saying is that if I, so I pick one. I don't care whether the polar are inside or outside. If I change it, it will change the value of the epsilon. That's yeah, okay. all. So there's going to be A's and B's and the other, the other elements that circle yeah. around the... Yeah, it gives you a basis of H1 of and sigma then minus P. And then the A's and B's are a subtractive basis for the unpunctured sigma. Yeah. Is it what and so that's the only thing I needed here in order to define the filling fraction. Now later on, if you want to, do, to follow the proof to the end, you would have to introduce the, the basis of H1 of sigma minus P. But for what we're doing here, just for the filling fraction, you don't need it. What will happen is that, okay, the epsilon one, uh, the epsilon I, the filling fractions themselves, their value, they depend on the choice of basis you take, okay? If you change it, uh, you will change the epsilon. But the one from YDX doesn't change. Is it more clear? Okay, so I will keep that. No, yeah, what I was saying is that the fixing the T's, say it doesn't fix the one from YDX completely, but it fixes part of the, 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 the H, just the higher order one. And so let's see it here in an example. Ah. Okay. Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, pop, pop. Yeah. No. Sorry. Uh, um, I just come back to the question. So I agree there should be the sigma minus p because otherwise you, you have uh, you would have to to um, you would change the value of the epsilon one if you go from one one pole to the uh, if you go around one of the pole because you might have non-vanishing residues. Okay, um, so we are there, and so let me give an example. So we'll take the example where n is equal to zero there, meaning that I don't have any poles away from infinity. So I get q of x, which is a polynomial. And I want it to be a polynomial of degree four, so I take r infinity is equal to four. So that r infinity minus two is equal to two, and two times two is equal to four. So what I get is um, something uh, of this form, uh, this one. It means that y dx, it has an expansion of this type, So you start with t infinity four x to the power of two dx minus plus t infinity three x dx minus plus t infinity two dx minus plus t infinity one dx over x plus o of dx over x squared. So I am just taking this formula with r infinity is equal to four. Now, what is the spectral curve corresponding to this case? So I can look at the expansion of y square around infinity. So in this case, I just have one pole meaning that Q of X should be a polynomial of degree four. So I just have to compute the polynomial part of Y square. So I get Y square is equal to T infinity four squared X to the power four plus, and then I get two times T infinity three T infinity four times x cubed plus t infinity three squared plus two times t infinity 
to the infinity 4 times x to the square plus now for x I get 2 times t infinity 1 t infinity 4 plus 2 times t infinity 2 t infinity 3 times x and now let's say that I want to see the constant term I will get contribution from uh, t infinity 1 times t infinity 3 okay I can express it in terms of the t's t infinity two, t 2 square okay but t infinity 4 has to be might be multiplied by the coefficient here and I cannot express it in terms of the t's so I've got one coefficient the constant coefficient which I call h0 which I cannot express just in terms of the t's so there is one coefficient to be fixed but now if I look at this curve this is a double, double cover of p1 of degree 4 so you can think of it as being ramified at four points so let's take a simple picture of this type if you look at it it means that you get a genus 1 curve so the genus is equal to the number of coefficients I'm missing here and you see that it is equal to the number of epsilon as well so in general and you will prove it in the exercise session what you will have is that in this coefficient here you've got many of them which are fixed by the t's and you will be missing g of them where g is the genus of the curve yeah so if I were to think in the terms of uh, say I take a spectral curve of that form for me it arises as you know very well in the theory of Pandere equations right yeah. so when this h0 are you thinking of it as fixed by the accessory parameters by the access so-called accessories parameter accessory parameters. Uh, what do you call accessory okay so the coordinates of the actual solution of pan -ray. so q and p yeah 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 sure yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. so here I took it as an example because at the end of the day you will get one of the two equations here and yeah that's exactly the perspective we took actually the, the way we obtain the uh, representation which seems to be good for us in order to derive the proof was coming from the study of one of the equation okay so what you will find out in general is that some of the h will be fixed by the t's they would correspond to Casimir's when you think of the integrable system when you fix your Casimir it means that you are choosing a symplectic leaf let's say in the space of quadratic differential you have a symplectic structure and the symplectic space will be basically of dimension 2g where g is the, the genus of the curve and so the missing coefficient here will be Hamiltonian corresponding to flows uh, in this space uh, just something I don't know Bertrand did you talk about the Newton polytope no. no just want to mention a way to obtain the genus of a, of a curve of this type uh, a recipe which might be useful sometimes which will show you so in the in the case of a hyperelliptic curve it's not very hard to find the genus but sometimes it's a bit more tricky and there is a very simple way to do it which is by writing uh, the Newton polytope so if you start from some e of x y of this form and you wonder what is the genus of the curve defined by e of x y equals to zero one way to get it quite fast in a generic case so for generic value of the alphas here is by drawing, drawing the Newton top so you 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 draw some integer lattice in this direction you will think of it as being the degree of X here the degree of Y 
whenever you've got some alpha ij, which is non-vanishing in your equation, you put a dot at the position aj in your lattice. So for example, here I've got an equation which is y squared is equal to a polynomial of degree four. So I've got alpha zero two, which is non-vanishing here. And I've got all the x, which are non-vanishing here. When I've done that, I draw the polytope here, up, obtained. And I look inside and I count the number of points, integer points inside the polytope. So here, you, um, oh. ah, sorry, yeah, I had one more. So zero, one, two. And here what you will get is that you just have one point which is inside. Okay, just the point one, one. The number of points which is inside the polytope is for generic value of alpha, the genus of the curve that you're considering. So in this case, it's very easy. I just have one, so I've got the genus one here. Yeah? Sorry? Sorry, if you consider the degree of the polynomial, you can find easy also the, the genus, right? Yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's a very simple way to say it. Bertrand, you wanted to say something? Ah, yeah. Okay. So, so up to ten fifty, is that correct? Okay. Let's say 1055. I mean, there will be a break after. Okay. Now, up to now, I just looked at the spectral curve and nothing else. I didn't talk about topology correction. So, what I want to do is to define and use the topology correction for this kind of uh, spectral curve. So, I'm starting from y squared is equal to q of x. And what I do is that I define omega zero one as the one form y dx. For defining the topological recursion, I don't need only omega zero one or the equation of the spectral curve, but I need also omega zero two. In order to define omega zero two, there are many ways to make a choice, but what I will do here is that I fix a basis of and no it's a basis of H1 sigma C. Which I call A I D I. And I just um, yeah I should take the same one, sorry. So I will pick the same one as I did there. And what I will do is that I will Enforce my one form, uh, my two form omega zero two, to a vanishing peri period along the A cycle. So omega zero two is defined by the fact that I, I think that you've seen that many times now after this week. Omega zero two is defined as being uh, a differential in uh, sigma squared with poles only on the diagonal. Uh, with uh, without residue, with a double pole, and uh, with a coefficient which is fixed. So it fixes the, the, um, the pole structure of omega zero two. Now you need to fix also its holomorphic part, let's say, and we do that by fixing that the A period along a given and chosen basis are vanishing. If you do that, omega zero two is fixed, okay? If we would have a genus zero curve, uh, we wouldn't have to make such a choice. It means that here, uh, everything would be fixed basically by the equation of the spectral curve. Now, if I do that, 
if I take n uh, greater or equal to 1 and h uh, to h minus 2 plus n greater or equal to 1, I define omega h n. Uh, let me know if it's too small again. So I will define by induction some omega h n, which is n, which are n form on sigma to the power of n. By the following recursion formula, you take all the points, uh, all the ramification points. So. In this case, for example, you've got four of them. So what I call R is the set of ramification points. Yeah. Great. Could I quickly ask, uh, so omega search is determined by, it has to have double poles along the diagonal. Yeah. Then it has to have this vanishing uh, condition yeah. on the integral and nothing else? Nothing, uh, so we have to be more precise. You need to have that on the diagonal in any local coordinate. It behaves like uh, dz1, dz2, over c1 minus c2 square uh, plus holomorphism. OK? So you fix the coefficient here as well. Okay, and then the second condition is some condition on the holomorphic part? Yeah, I because suppose. if I just give you that, once again, you could shift it by some holomorphic form. Uh, holomorphic form. Actually, you could shift it, you see, by uh, a product of holomorphic form, I mean holomorphic form in Z1 and Z2. So the, the dimension of shift is quite big. So but here, just by fixing that, I fix completely all of these. Okay, thank okay? you. a typo, you're going from Z1 to Zn. So yeah, there is. <laughs> Thank you. So R is the set of, uh, of branch points, sorry. Branch. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I will write it here. Okay, and maybe I will leave the formula here. So we've got omega h n of z1 up to z n, which is the sum over p being a branch point, I consider the residue when z goes to p. So I take the residue at all the branch points of the following thing. First, I use a recursion kernel. So I take omega 0, 2. So it's a form in two variables. So the first one is z1, and the second one is integrated from sigma of z to z, where I will write it here, sigma is the hyper elliptic involution. So basically it tells you that x of sigma of z is equal to x of z. So x is fixed by sigma, but y changes size. So if you consider your equation here, sigma changes the branch of solution you consider. So it exchanges the two shapes. Yeah? Sorry? Yeah? Yeah, in this case, yes. In general, it is not. Uh, that's why the hyperlyptic case is easier to present and to deal with. And the 
Yeah, the, the same one as here. And so the second one is from sigma of z to z, where z is the, the point you use for the recipe. And you take the difference between omega 0, 1 of z minus omega 0, 1 of sigma of z. Oh, oh, and one more. Uh, you see that in this case, omega 0, 1 is y dx, and y changes sign. So here I could replace it by four times y of z dx of z. No, it's not all. So it's, a re it's an induction on h and, and n. And so we multiply it by formula which recovers the drawing which was on the left blackboard when you arrived. First, you decrease the genus h by 1 and increase n by 1. And you evaluate it at z, sigma of z, z2 up to zn. So I guess you've seen, I mean, everybody has seen this formula already, right? hope so. OK, and then we make a sum of this type. We take a partition of the set z2 to zn. We cut h into two parts, h1 and h2. And we basically distribute h and the variables here, I mean z2 to zn, except by removing z1, into two parts, uh, into two omegas. The first with the genus h1, a plus 1, and with the first argument c, and the second one with genus h2, c plus 1, sigma of z, Now, let's say that I give you this formula. And here I could have, let's say, h1 is equal to 0 and a being empty. This would give me here some omega 0, 1, and here some omega h, n. This would be an issue because this is what I want to use to define that. So I've got to remove that. So I want to impose the, the cardinal of a, h, uh, is not in the set, so zero, zero. Neither in the set, uh, so it would be n minus one and h. Sorry? No, omega zero two is still there. Because you see, if I've got some omega zero two here, okay. so I've got omega zero two here, it means that I've got a variable here. Here the genus would be h, and here I would have one less variable compared to what I have here. So it's okay. But later I will remove omega zero two as well. Okay, so that's the definition that we use for the topological recursion. No, this is valid only for n greater or equal to 1. So you need at least one variable. So you, need, you will have a one form. But we can define it also for n is equal to 0. So I will not give you all the formulae. But I will give you a formula for h greater or equal to 2. We can define some omega h0, which is now just a number. And it's 1 over 2 minus 2h, two sum over p branch point. Yeah, it's going to be too small again. 1 over 2 minus 2h two residue. sum over p 
French point, residue when C goes to P of, and you take omega H1, so you add one point, C, and you integrate uh, y dx, yeah, a little bit, or omega zero one from um, a reference point O to Z. So a priori, this would depend on the base point that you take, but because of some property of the omega H, uh, one of which you will prove in the exercise session, omega H do not have uh, any any residue at the branch point, so that when you change the the base point, it doesn't change the the, the the residue here, okay? So omega H1 and omega H1 and omega H1 here, if you, if you wish, yeah. So there exists formula in for H equal to one and zero, but they are a bit more complicated, so I don't want to, do it, to write them here. <coughs> okay. So we've got uh, basically omega hn for arbitrary value of h and n um, starting from zero. And out of that, we want to build to a function. But before going there, uh, I want to introduce some property uh, for this uh, differential form omega which I will call sometime um, correlation function because of their origin in the matrix model seven. So I want to introduce some variational formula which study the, the following um, question. What happens if I change the value of the t's? Uh, how does it impact the omega hn? And there is a nice way to, to obtain it in general. So the t's here, they are obtained by considering residue at the poles of y dx. So they are residue of something. <laughs> um, in, in such a case, uh, we have shown uh, that the topological recursion produces a correlation function such that the derivative of the omega hn with respect to these times, computed as residue, can be themselves written as residues. So I will write the, the resulting formula in this case. So for h greater or equal to, uh, sorry, for k greater or equal to two, d omega h n over d t infinity k. I want to compute that. So the recipe is usually is that if T, I mean, if this T is given by a residue, let's say at infinity, then d omega hn over d t will be given by a residue along some dual cycle of omega hn plus one. So here I would have omega hn of, let's say, d1 to dn. It is equal to what? It's the residue. So here, in order to get the infinity k, I need to compute a residue at, at uh, infinity. But I want to make to compute a residue on the spectral curve. So consider infinity plus. And it's a residue of omega h, the same h, n plus 1. The additional variable is the one I take for the residue, d1 up to dn, times some function of x. So in this case, it's this. But it's not quite true in this case because the t's that you appear in the expansion of ydx around infinity plus and infinity minus. So actually, I should consider a contribution coming from both sides. So I've got exactly the same formula. d1 up to dn. So t to the power of k minus one. So that's a formula which tells you how to compute the variation of omega hn with respect to this time.
No, I will need as well uh, what happens for uh, yeah. for the poles uh, for the T nu k. It's exactly the same kind of formula. It's the residue when z goes to alpha nu plus of omega h n plus one of v t one t n. times, and here I will get x of v minus lambda nu to the power minus k, k plus 1 divided by k minus 1 minus the residue when z goes to alpha nu minus So you'll get used to the fact that I bother people a lot. <laughs> so can I write this formula? Like, um, so in the first part of the course by Bertrand, uh, he was, uh, instead of taking, I think, maybe, <laughs> instead <laughs> of taking the residue on this, so he was writing this residue at infinity and simply saying z and minus z, right? Um, because- uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah, could do that, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, and in addition, actually, there is a symmetry under the hyperelliptic involution, which m makes that you could have some simpler formula. But here, I just want to emphasize the fact that, basically, the t they appear, um, I if you wouldn't have the symmetry for y, the fact that y of sigma of z is equal to minus y of z, you could have two independent sets of times, and you would consider uh, variation of both of them, but both of them are related by a change of sign, and that's the reason why you've got that. Okay. Okay. So, in particular, I want you to keep in mind that, in some sense, the um, the expansion of omega h n plus one around the poles of y dx encodes or can be a generating series for the variation of omega hn with respect to the t's. And this will turn out to be important later on. Sorry? So what I'm saying is that the expansion around the poles of omega hn plus one, you can think of it as a generating series for the variation of omega hn with respect to the times. So I don't know, Bertrand, or did anybody talk about the variational formulae last week? Yes. Yeah? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. It's a branch point, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so uh, let me just mention here I consider Q of X, which is, uh, which has an even degree as a polynomial in X. So as we were saying before, uh, if you have an odd degree, you would have uh, something which is ramified at above infinity, and this is the case of the array curve. So the array curve doesn't directly follow what I'm doing here, uh, but, uh, but it's exactly the same type of thing. Just you, you need some other local coordinates. Uh, Any other question? No? So, in particular, this is true for h equals zero and n is equal to zero. What does it mean? It means that if you want to, if you compute the residue of omega zero one times some power of x around infinity, so around the poles of y dx, so part of the expansion of y dx around infinity it's given, so here you see it's given by the times themselves, but what happens after? After the first few coefficients will be given by the variation of omega zero, zero with respect to the time. So what I'm adding here in this big O, this regular part, the first few orders actually, I can write them explicitly as 
variation of omega zero zero with respect to the time. And that's the only thing I will need in order to um, in order to obtain a nice formula for H zero here, for example. So I will apply this formula for um, for h n equals to zero. What you get is that part of the coefficient of y dx, so further in the expansion that I did write on before, are given by derivative of omega zero zero with respect to the t's. And now I can write y squared just in terms of t and d omega zero zero over dt. Uh, in particular, it gives me an equation of this form. Now if I want to compute q of x, I have a nicer formula. I take um, yeah, I take the uh, yeah. the polynomial part around infinity of of y, which is this part. So this is the singular part which I was showing before. So it's starting from uh, yeah. this. Uh, you see, no, it's not exactly the polynomial part. It's the, it's the part which contributes to the regular part of y dx. I take it to the square. So I'm missing all the big O that I had before. And I just take the, no, the polynomial part of the resulting object. So with that, I will recover all the part, the expression in Q of x I had before, depending only on the t's. I do the same thing Okay. Uh, one minute. Yeah. So that, that is the, the um, let's say it's the x to the power i i greater or equal to zero in the expansion. So that's the polynomial part included the constant term. Okay? Now I do the same thing for all the lambda news. So I'm writing as before some from k equals one to r nu. I add this t nu k was behaving in this way, x minus lambda nu to the power k. I square it. And now I take the singular part at lambda nu. So these are the one over x minus lambda nu to the power i with i at least equal to one. So the constant term, I take it from this part, from the contribution in at infinity. And here I just take the, the singular part, okay? It's not over. <laughs> Sorry, what is omega zero zero though? What did you? So I didn't define it here. Ah, uh, so, but there is a formula which I don't want to write on because it, I mean it would be a bit too long. So there is a formula for writing it. So for example, you, you see that this formula is not working for h equal to one directly. But there is a formula coming from the, the matrix model setup. Okay, so that's the beginning of the equation. So here I just have terms which depend on the t's. So I'm missing one part, I know it. I follow it here. And this is of this form. So this is a linear combination of some uh, rational function. Here's some polynomial in x times d omega zero zero over 
dt infinity k plus sum over k in k nu, I sum for nu going from 1 to n, u nu k of x, d omega 0, 0 over d t nu k. So let me tell you what is there. K infinity is the set, uh, yeah, two r infinity minus two, and for k in k infinity, u infinity k of x is a polynomial defined by k minus one, sum for l going from k plus two to r infinity of t infinity l x to the power l minus k minus two. In the same way, k nu is two r nu plus one. And for k in k nu, u nu k of x gives you a rational function which has a pole only when x goes to lambda nu of exactly the same form, k minus one, sum l ranging from k minus one to r nu, t nu l, x minus lambda nu to the power minus l plus k minus two. Okay, so if you think about it, so here I have got something which is, if I would take y square, I told you the first part of the expansion around the pole is given just by the t k times x to some power. So let's look at infinities. Infinity k x to the power k minus two. And the remaining is d, over d omega zero zero over d t k times some x to some power. If I take the square of this, I will have things which are quadratic in t's which I see here, and which I, I will have things which will be product of t's and d omega zero zero over dt. And that's the only thing I did right on here, okay? So what I did is just take this formula for h n equal to zero zero, use that in order to get the first coefficient of the expansion of uh, omega zero one, and write down y square, and I know it's a rational function, so I just look at its singular part at its pole and it gives me this formula. So this is something you will do in the exercise session as well, explicitly. Okay. So I'm pretty happy because now I've got something which is much nicer in the sense that I don't have this H0 which I didn't know, but I've got something which, I've got a nicer formula for H0. And so let's look at what happened in the example that we had before. So we had this uh, y square is equal to t infinity four square x four plus two times t infinity three t infinity four x cubed plus t infinity three square plus two times t infinity four t infinity uh, two times x square plus two times t infinity four t infinity one plus two times t infinity three t infinity two times x. All of this comes from just this part of the formula. And now for the constant term, I've got some coming from this part and some coming from this part n equals to zero, so this doesn't appear. Here, k infinity is just r if infinity is equal to four, so just equal to two, to the set two. So I will just have to compute u infinity two, and I can do it. And so what I end up with is first the contribution coming from this part. So I just keep on doing what I was doing before. 
2 times t infinity, uh, t infinity to square. So this is coming from this part. And there is a last uh, bit coming from this part, which is just t infinity 4, d omega 0, 0 over d t infinity 2. Now, if you know about uh, Panavé equation, for example, Panavé two equation, I guess you're happy with that. Because the constant term in the Panavé equation should be a Hamiltonian for your system. And it should be equal to the derivative of the log of the tau function, the isomonotonic tau function. And omega zero, zero, you can think of it as being the log of, or the leading order in the h-bar expansion of what should be the log of the tau function of your system. So that's why when I've got such a formula, I'm pretty happy from the integrable system perspective. Now, this is something coming just from the h equals to zero and equals to zero case. Now, if I wouldn't have this, so I and you go back, for example, to the array case, the spectral curve is just, basically, you start it from if you would start from this equation, and you're looking for a solution to this equation, a so-called WKB uh, solution of the form, um, yeah. exponential h bar to the power minus one integral of uh, omega zero one going to x, so these are pure notation, times O of one in the dh bar expansion. So if you're looking for a solution of this type, then what you will see is that when you take your second order derivative multiplied by h bar, um, whenever you've got the h bar d over dx, you bring some h bar minus one down here and some omega zero, one down. Uh, okay, so some, or write it as y dx. Sorry. And this is the, the leading order contribution. So the leading order contribution of this equation will imply that y square is equal to x. So in some sense, the um, spectral curve is just the leading order contribution for the h bar expansion of this equation. Now here I've got something very similar. I've got something which look like coming from this plus some d over dt. Now what we'll, we'll find out is that there is a generalization of this formula for the higher order term in h bar. So which will correct this equation so that it is valid for a quantization of the curve we started from. And that's what I'm gonna do next. So Maybe it's a good time for a break, even if I'm a bit early. <laughs> <laughs>